Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another very special edition of WOWS Alive with our host, Ned Dennison. Hello, everyone. I'm the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. We had a conversation uh, a week or so back, and um, we thought we would add another one to it, which was longevity. So we've got today uh, Sally Minty Gravit and Otto Tanning. Um, please introduce yourselves. Uh, Sally, you go first. Just give us an idea of how long you've been swimming, um, how, how everything's holding up, et cetera, et cetera. Then we'll get to some questions. Sure. I'm Sally Minty Gravit. I live in Jersey in the Channel Islands. And I've been swimming the channel for 45 years. My, I started sea swimming at the age of three because we didn't have indoor pools. I'm 63 now. I'm still swimming. And uh, my first channel swim was when I was 18. So um, I've been doing it a long time. A any significant injuries? Um... No injuries at all. Just a bit of tendonitis once in 1992 but uh nothing since uh since then really and describe your swimming stroke on a scale from 10 being perfect to zero being ned denison okay so um people have told me that my stroke is very efficient i've done it all my life i've never had to change it and i think because i've not had any injuries i think it's probably pretty good for what i do um it's probably not, it's, it's technically a perfect stroke because I do a six beat kick and I have slow rate of uh, swimming. Um, I kind of, now I, I used to do 66 strokes a minute. So I'm probably regularly between 55 and 60 now, I think on a regular basis. And I can maintain that for a really long time. So uh, yeah. And Otto, uh, give us a similar description of your prowess. Well, I've been having started the age of 79, that's now. Um, I'm a graduate from the Bits University, which is uh, in Johannesburg, where I studied surgery, and I qualified there. And then I moved to Cape Town because I wanted to do uh, cardiac surgery, and I did that under Chris Bonnard, who was at that st uh, stage shortly after the first heart transplant. Uh, so I spent the last 10 years of his life um, working for him, and when he retired, I went into private practice in a hospital that now is known as the Christian Barnard Memorial Hospital, where I am still active. Um, in terms of my swimming, I swam the English Channel in 1994, and then again in 2014. I've done a number of Robin Island swims, and I swam with Lewis Pugh across Lake Malawi in 1992, which was the first time that that had ever been done. Um, I also swam Gibraltar, and I also accompanied Lewis Pugh on his uh, up the uh, English Channel swim for the last six days. That was the one from New uh, from uh, Lens into to Dover. Um, as far as spare parts are concerned, I think I played too much squash in my youth, and I had a hip replaced in 2018 and a knee in April of this year. And that was done intentionally because I anticipated the lockdown and the closure of medical facilities. So I was lucky to have my rehab done during lockdown and I'm now fully recovered. But I haven't been able to swim at all uh, during this period because all our pools and we're not even supposed to be swimming in the sea, which a lot of people are actually doing at the moment. Um, as far as my stroke is concerned, um, I think the only uh, the thing that sticks out a bit is that I have a very slow cadence. I averaged, when I swam the English Channel the last time, of just in the lower, very lower 40s uh, strokes per minute. Um, I tend to concentrate on very good underwater catchment, and I try very hard to be smooth. Um, I have swum consistently since the age of 10, except for the last three, four months where COVID has stopped me swimming. So I'm looking forward. Otto, why don't you continue and tell us uh, what you think the physiological benefits of swimming are? That's a long one, and I'll try and make it um, as I see it. And please break into my uh, diatribe simply because uh, it's quite a big one. You know, swimming physiologically, in my opinion, um, is a great um, interest simply because you're swimming in an environment 
uh, where you are weightless. And it's completely different from any other sport uh, where you have a very significant effect of gravity. The other point is that swimming is undertaken mainly in the prone position, in other words, lying face down. And that completely changes the hemodynamics, especially of the venous return and of the circulation. And it borders into a very interesting um, problem, um, which I'm sure you're all coming uh, know well. It's called SUP. It's an acronym which stands for swimming induced pulmonary edema. And that's a condition that is aggravated by a tremendously efficient venous return, which happens when you're lying uh, uh, down as opposed to standing up. Remember that most, most other sports you are running vertically or standing up or sitting on a, on a bicycle. And the circulatory changes from being vertical to horizontal are very significant. And that happens in the early stage of a ultra triathlon for a number of reasons, mainly because the people are very worked up and secondly, because they have wetsuits just for the swim. And a wetsuit also improves the venous return. So they jump into the water, they kick very hard and early in the swim, they develop a pulmonary overload because of the venous return and go into pulmonary edema. And it puzzled people for a long time because a number of these people died and they died and were considered to be uh, uh, the, the product of, of uh, drowning. But the reality was that they had this excessive um, venous return aided by the wetsuit, kicking very hard and lying supine. And that pushed them into the condition that if they stopped swimming, they recovered. But sometimes that took up to a week. And that has, uh, a big, I think, um, influence on the fact that swimming is different uh, in terms of the muscle effort that you undertake. Um, all skeletal muscle that works very hard when you swim is working in an isometric manner. In other words, you are pushing against, the strongest thing you can push against is the water, and it's not resistant. Uh, if you're running, your feet stamp on the tar or on the road, it's a, a very powerful um, effect which I consider to be negative on your mus musculature and obviously on your, on your uh, joints. Um, in water during a contraction, um, in the pool, the force that you can exert is limited by how much water you can catch or latch onto, but it's always enough for you not to have to contract that muscle ma maximally. And if you do contract a muscle maximally, for example, lifting a very heavy weight, during that time, the pressure in the actual muscle is higher than the arterial pressure generated by your own heart or your circulation, which means that during that period, there's actually no blood flow through the muscle. So in swimming, you normally have a good blood flow through all muscles, but you, have, you can make it even better by relaxing when you are in the so-called recovery phase. So if you divide the arm swing or the arm stroke into four quarters, the first quarter being the point from where the hand is put into the water until the arm is vertically below the head, that's the first quarter. The second quarter is from there to the extraction part. Those quarters, one and two, are the ones in which the effort is made. And then three and four is the recovery. And if you see somebody swimming with a very tense arm recovering, they're not allowing a good flush through, uh, through the muscles by the circulation. So physiologically, if the concentration is on a good catch, a smooth entry and a smooth exit, and a gentle pull throughout that um, I call it the stroke, um, not the recovery. Um, it makes, makes for a, a very good physiological uh, response to the swimming. Um, the cardiovascular benefits are tremendous because the amount of effort and calorie burn in swimming is much higher than most other sports. The other thing that's very interesting in my opinion in open water swimming, um, it's the longest of most major um, athletic um, 
expertise. In other words, how long does it take to swim open water compared to the competitive things in running or squash or in or tennis? Um, swimming, the English Channel is around about 15 hours average. And uh, the only one that comes close to it is the Ironman in which the winner is usually uh, able to complete it by about eight or nine hours. And that I think is one of the great benefits of swimming is that it requires the fitness and it requires a very good technique. And it also is a very high sustained output in terms of calorie, cal calories. Um, I don't know if you want to, uh, me to, to, to go further on that, but I think that that encompasses the really important physiological aspects of swimming and benefits. Um, um, Sally, you're, you're, fo you're, you're following a doctor, so, so never particularly easy, but at the same time, you've been coaching swimming for a long, long time. Um, do you want to add to the, the physiological thing for the, the less technical bend? Um, I think... I think one of the main reasons why I've not been injured is because I've had, I haven't done things very, very close together. I think because I've always loved to be in the water and I've always loved swimming. I've done things when it's suited my work life at the time. And I think I understand everything that Otto said and I, 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 I found it fascinating what he was saying. And I've never really thought of that side of things because I'm just a human. I'm not a cardiologist. But I think um, I'm an asthmatic and I wasn't diagnosed until I was 35. So in 1992. Um, and that was following probably the longest break I'd had since my second channel swim in 80. No. So I had a shorter break between my second and my third channel swim and then a longer break to my fourth. And I think part of that was work and the fact that I had to come to terms with I was asthmatic. So I think swimming is probably one of the best things, I'm sure Otto would agree, to ease uh, asthmatic symptoms. There's a lot of very good swimmers and long distance swimmers that are asthmatic. Ali Streeter was, and a lot of the top swimmers are asthmatic and they, they, in their youth, their parents say, and the doctors say, you know, take up swimming because it help, helps your lung capacity increase and helps your breathing and and swimming but um i don't think i can add anything to what otto said um because i don't have the technical knowledge but i do know that if you've got a chest infection you don't swim i know that from my experience and i don't recommend anybody that does have swims with a chest infection um i'm sure otto has his own thinking but i'm pretty sure he'd probably agree with that no i do totally Sally, um, you uh, you once said a you once won a a, a trophy uh, for the CSA for the fastest crossing for for a season. How how is your speed now compared to when you were twenty, thirty, forty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Interesting. Well, I was eighteen. Uh, my time that year in nineteen seventy five, which is forty five years ago, was eleven hours fifty seven. In nineteen eighty five, I did fifteen hours oh three, so I was ten years older. 1992, I think I was probably as fit as I was when I was 18, but I didn't do the bulk of training that I did when I was 18. Um, I have to say that after my first channel swim, I couldn't lift my arms up. Um, I think I was overtrained. I did probably 900 miles of training in that year, uh, but I was 18 and I could do it. And I had the time, I wasn't working. By the time I was 85, I was working and I was uh, different and I was probably fitter, technologically fitter um, and strength wise in 85, but I got held up in the channel. So you have to balance the logistics with fitness because you can be the fittest person in the world, but you get held up by the French authorities like I was in 1985 and your swim is slowed down and you have no control. 1992, I did 12 hours and eight. I was 35. I did France to England that year. And uh, so that wasn't much difference to my first one. Um, it's probably 10, eight or nine minutes. So time is immaterial. Uh, a channel swim is a channel swim, whether it's 10 hours, six hours, 15 hours, 28 hours, you are still a channel swimmer. And I think 
a lot of people lose sight of that when they're trying to do the channel and they think they have a time in mind and I think psychologically that's the wrong approach to a channel swim I think psychologically you swim the channel to get to France and you swim the channel to get to the other side so if I'm coaching and advising anyone and that's what I say and I try not to let them have a time in mind um, and then my subsequent swims were slower for my 2013 swim was uh, my first attempt at a two-way and I went on a very big spring and I was very, very sick and we were in a thunderstorm and I was taken very off course when I, every time I was being sick and I wasn't very well at all and that was like an early 18-hour swim. And then the first leg of my two-way four years ago was exactly the same time as my 1985 swim. So I don't think time is important and I don't think it plays a lot of importance in channel swimming personally. You're not, you're not doing 900 miles a year anymore. Is that because uh, um, work, work pressure or you've decided you don't need it or you can't do it? I've decided I don't need to do 900 miles anymore. Um, in, 19, in 1975, when I was doing that, I wasn't working. I'd just left school. I was waiting to start work. I had the summer free. We were training with a relay team to swim the channel in the centenary race in 75. And I was super fit, super fast and young. And that really helped. And um, my work life changed over the years for various reasons. And that affects your training. But I certainly don't believe you need to do that much training now. And I would, I always advise people not to do, to overtrain because I think that's why my arms hurt. After my two way, which was 36 and a half hours, I could move my arms straight away. I wasn't overtrained. Um, and I took my time as everybody knows. Um, and I was 59. And, and I think that's very important with, uh, not overtraining and I'd rested for a month before that properly rested and slept a lot and that was a very important part of the whole training thing for a, a big swim like that. And Otto what's your speed done over the years? I think it's 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 gone off quite significantly. Um, the first time I swam which was the one in 1994 um, I did a quite a fast time uh, I thought for myself at the time as well uh, 1029 I think it was um, and the most recent one uh, which was exactly almost to the day 20 years uh, later I did 1250 something so the fall off was quite significant um, but I, I agree with Sally I think it's more about the conditions of the day than, than how, how fast you are obviously yeah. the very fast guys are lucky because they only hit the nasty um, uh, um, tides once if they're lucky or if they're yeah. very quick whereas yeah. we we hit them two or three times and that i think is is a very important the the one other thing that i thought would be of interest is that i have a, a fairly strong idea or a concept on one of the biggest challenges certainly for people who come to the southern hemisphere in the warm is this question of cold adaptation yeah. and cold adaptation is i think very complex but extremely interesting. Um, the crucial point is that you're not training to become cold. You're training to avoid becoming cold. Yeah. And the fundamental reason for that is that your core, your muscles, your liver, your brain, everything functions best and normally at a normal core temperature, which is 37 degrees or 98.4 Fahrenheit. Um, and the point about swimming in cold water is the Atlantic, in, in, in the case of the channel, is a hell of a lot bigger than uh, an average human being who may be, let's say, 80 kilograms. I don't know how many trillions of tons of water there is in the Atlantic. And if the Atlantic is cold, it's going to win and it's going to eventually get your temperature down to the Atlantic level. But the training of being able to tolerate cold water is not to become cold, but to prevent becoming cold. And that's a physiological thing. You have to train your physiology to stop losing heat. And you lose heat mainly from the skin, a little bit from your respiration. 
And the way you do that is you shut your, your skin circulation down. You don't do it consciously. It's done through regular training. And we've got the ideal, ideal setup in Cape Town for that, uh, a, a large 50 meter pool, which is seawater on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the beach almost. And in our summer, that's around about January, it is as high as about 24 centigrade. But it then goes down very slowly until our winter. Uh, about now it's down to about 11 or 10. So if you swim in that pool regularly, every time you go training and you train in that pool, by the time you reach our, our, our winter, uh, you are very cold water um, adapted. And one of the interesting things was in the training of Lewis Pugh when he was going to swim across the um, North Pole, he spent a lot of time swimming in an ice bucket or in an ice porter pool. And I was the this designated doctor to help oversee this. And he would get into this water. We could set the, the temperature of, the, of that water just by adding uh, different amounts of uh, crushed ice to, to the water. So we would start at, say, 12 degrees, and then bring it down to 11, and then bring it down to 10, and so forth. And on one occasion, we were down just below 10. Um, we had to measure his core temperature, which was quite a, an episode. It was a rectal probe that had to be neatly inserted behind some curtains. And uh, the guys uh, reading the computer, because it was all done with tele telemetry, they would sit behind the computers and they suddenly say, you're in the right spot, go, he can go and swim. And they came to me and they said, uh, look, we've got a problem. He's got a temperature of um, 38.5, which is significantly elevated. And the rule that we have is if you've got an illness or a viral illness uh, and your temperature is up, you do not swim. As you said, um, Sally, it's an absolute no-no yeah. because that is associated with a lot of major problems all over the place. So I examined him and found absolutely no reason for this elevated temp uh, temperature. He was very keen to swim and I had a second medical opinion and he, he was allowed to swim and he swam without any problems. And then a lot of discussion went on as to why this should have happened. And uh, Tim Noakes, who is quite famous in South Africa and internationally as well, was also involved. And he coined something called anticipatory thermogenesis, in that he had started, Lewis had started to stop losing heat by diverting his blood uh, through his skin uh, or away from his skin. And therefore his core temperature went up. It also went up because of the metabolic effects of the sympathetic nervous system, which also elevated his temperature. But this was before he actually got in the water, and that's why they called it anticipatory thermogenesis. And the big question was, what was going to happen on the second or third or fourth um, um, uh, period when he was going to get in the water at low temperatures? And it happened consistently that about half an hour before being told that he was going to swim, by the time he was ready to swim, his temperature was up by nearly two degrees. And that's amazing. points to the fact that what you are actually training when you do this cold water swimming is to stop losing heat as early as possible. So you take an ordinary person and put them in cold water, they'll tell you it's bloody cold, and they will start losing, uh, uh, their, 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 uh, they'll start losing their, their core temperature. But a trained person will also say it's bloody cold but they will prevent losing the temperature as quickly as, an, as a normal person. It obviously helps to be well padded, um, and you don't see many people who are successful in the channel who look as if they can run a marathon, in other words, are lean and mean and hungry. So it's just a very interesting concept, in my opinion, that the training is not just training the muscles and training all the uh, cardiorespiratory aspect, but also the autonomic nervous system, uh, which is the, the, the governor of your internal milieu, which you can't control, but you can challenge. And that's one of the things that I use uh, in answer to the question of the so-called challenging of longevity. That if you do that, challenge your body with whatever it is, but in this instance by cold swimming, you're actually fine-tuning your autonomic nervous system, which is 
a sort of a uh, long levity um, mechanism. You're actually improving your internal control as opposed to allowing it to go the way that most old people go. And uh, the, the, the characteristic of old age is things get stiff and they don't work. But if you push them to work, and especially getting your autonomic nervous system to react very quickly, I think you can in some way invi uh, uh, invite long le levity. And my example in this is if you ever get into a lif lift uh, with a whole lot of young people, especially young girls, and suddenly the lift moves down or up unexpectedly, they all make a big sort of reaction and some of them faint. And the old guys like us with spray here, we just stand there and watch them and laugh. But that's because they're lucky, they're young, they've got a very overactive, almost autonomic nervous system. So they perceive of things internally far more than we do. But we can, cha we can challenge that by training it. And that's one of the reasons why I believe cold water swimming is actually a secret weapon. Sally, um, Sally before, before, before somebody gets in and starts doing all this training, um, they have to be typically motivated and, and typically have a goal. How, how do you keep motivated? What, you know, do you continually set goals? Um, I think, I think I just do what I love and I do what I love and I'm, I try and benefit other people now. So I try and raise money for people. Um, I think I'm not, <laughs> I think I, I love watching people succeed and that motivates me as well. Um, I was supposed to do another channel swim this year, but I've not been able to. So that's held over till next year now, um, which will be my sixth solo in six different decades of my life. Um, and I think I, I'm even more determined to get it done properly next year and make, make sure it's a good one because it may be my last. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, I can always come out of retirement. But um, I think I don't overdo things. I do things for fun and I do things because I enjoy them. The day I don't enjoy them, I won't do it anymore. How, it's all about so, 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 so you, have your, you have your channel goal. Um, when you when you get up for an early morning um, session, and uh, the weather isn't nice, and you maybe you hear the rain on the on the window, are you more likely to go out training because you have the goal, or are you carpooling with three other people so you don't really have a choice? What's 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 driving that training, or you do you just wander down and train when when the weather's nice and, and the mood strikes you? Uh, it's variable actually. If I'm picking people up, uh, then I will make sure I go. But actually it, now at my age, if it's raining outside and it's dark and six o'clock, I probably won't go out of choice because I can go later because I'm not working now. So I have the choice. And, and Otto, last time well, I saw you in Cape Town, you were on a small motorbike. Are you on the small motorbike so you don't have to pick people up so you, you can also stay in bed when it's dark? <laughs> no, the small motorbike helps a lot to par find parking. And, okay. uh, we're very lucky uh, in my situation. Uh, the hospital that I work at is on the foreshore. Uh, there is a Virgin Active in that building at the moment. Um, like more, all of them, they're not open uh, in South Africa. Uh, the pool that I mentioned down in Seapoint, uh, the pavilion, is uh, a, a seven, eight minute uh, a scooter uh, a drive. But the beauty is that you can park right outside the facility at the front door. Whereas to find parking down there, especially on a, a day where there are lots of people, is uh, uh, difficult. So that's my only reason for riding the scooter. And I do so with a, a lot of temerity because we do see a lot of people who have come off these bikes quite uh, quite sadly and uh, a lot of them and and um are you somebody who has to set a goal to stay motivated or are you going out to swim whether you have a goal or not i think my my, my prime motivation is to swim and try and get it right um I, i've never done it the other way around i never said no, i've got to swim in order to do whatever it was i had set as a goal um, the goal is to try and be as old as possible and as, as well as possible. So 
That's what keeps me out of bed if I suddenly I'm wake there. up. I'm right with you there, Otto. <laughs> and that also takes away the sting because it's not like, oh my God, three weeks from now, I'm going to be suffering. Not at all. Uh, you, you don't suffer. Yeah. You get out because you want to do it for some, what you think is good for you. Yeah. And uh, I must say, it's been, a, it's been a fantastic ride and I enjoy every moment of it. And I have never in my life had four months without being in the water, which is what's happened over this, this uh, lockdown period, which, uh, in my opinion, especially now, has been a complete overreaction. Um, and I guess the, the final question for you both is, um, um, we, all three of us, and, and I'll include Steve Munitonis in this as well, we, we're the kind of um, unassisted marathon swimmer group. We, we, we typically aren't wearing wetsuits or fins or flippers or whatever. One of the one of the rules that I think we we should seriously consider bringing into sport is during races that it should be considered not only rude but you should be disqualified to pass anybody older than you. Would you have an opinion yeah. on that, Sally? Yeah, I agree. Mm. Otto, I don't do a lot. Of no, I'm very happy to be passed by somebody because. I have been luckier in, in, in a couple of situations where I've actually been able to pass the younger people and that makes me feel particularly good. Listen, thank you very much. Keep swimming, keep staying young and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing about your future exploits. Thanks folks. Thank you. Okay.